Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today to discuss CISL and the Investment Leaders Group's work on understanding the climate performance of investment funds and the new methodology developed with the group to uh, convert emissions reporting into an intuitive degree Celsius metric. I'm delighted to be joined today by my esteemed colleagues Dr Jake Reynolds and Dr Pablo Salas Bravo. Dr. Jake Reynolds is the Executive Director of Sustainable Economy with responsibility for CISL's research, including the Prince of Wales Global Sustainability Fellowship Programme. Jake acts as Senior Advisor to CISL's Centre for, Center for Sustainable Finance, which develops practical thought leadership through long running collaborations with the investment, banking and insurance industries. Dr. Pablo Salas Bravo is the Prince of Wales Global Sustainability Fellow in Radical Innovation and Disruption at CISL. He has been working alongside the Investment Leaders Group to explore and develop temperature scoring methods that effectively communicate fund climate impacts. Pablo is an interdisciplinary scholar whose background combines electrical engineering, extensive training in physics, mathematics, computer sciences, and dynamic systems, and postgraduate studies in economics and land economy. Over the next hour, Jake will outline the imperative for clear, transparent reporting to beneficiaries on the impacts of their investments, before Pablo walks us through the methodology developed in collaboration with the Investment Leaders Group to provide decision useful reporting to beneficiaries on their climate impacts. We'll also look at the underlying assumptions and explore different approaches to temperature scoring that are currently being developed before concluding with a Q&A session on the report and the method. So please do submit your questions during the discussion via the questions tab. To set the scene, the University of Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership is part of Cambridge University and has worked with leaders across finance, business and policy for over 30 years to develop leading solutions that drive a sustainable economy. We do that through developing applied research, convening leadership groups across finance, business and policy spaces, through postgraduate and executive education programmes, and lastly through our accelerator programme, working with SMEs to scale sustainability impact. The work that we're discussing today is the result of an ongoing inquiry into effective investment impact measurement with the Investment Leaders Group, a group of leading asset managers, owners and investment consultants convened by CISL's Centre for Sustainable Finance and supported by academics from within the university to advance sustainable investment by developing thought leading solutions and building sustainable finance capacity within membership organisations. I'm now going to hand over to Jake to discuss uh, reporting the impact of investment portfolios. Thank you so much, Lucy, and uh, welcome everybody. Real pleasure to uh, take part in this webinar today. Um, first, a little bit of background really on why we have created a framework for measuring the impact of investments and in particular public market investments. It's a long running project for CRSL as, as Lucy hinted and um, really occupies a central position in the work we do with the ILG. You may, next slide please Colette. You may have um, read some or all of these publications which have come out over recent years, some of them this year, from the IPCC, uh, launched its, um, its uh, policy summary uh, for the, uh, um, the, the, the 2021 review of where we are on the physical science for climate just this year. Of course, IPCC published in the bottom right their uh, call to arms really on climate change back in 2018, uh, suggesting we need to aim for 1.5 degrees maximum warming, not two. That of course created a stir at the time. In the meantime, we've had the IPBES assessment that's in the middle there on biodiversity, fairly grim picture about the loss of nature all over the world. We've had GS6 from the United Nations with a much similar story. And on the, the social inequality side, we've had uh, the United Nations um, World Social Report. That was 2020, January 2020, just before the pandemic. And at that time, one of the headlines from that report was 70% of world population subject to rising inequality. Now, just imagine that was before the pandemic hit. Imagine what the situation is now. 
So we have these, these reports from the scientific community, which are saying very, very loud and clear, both on the environmental and on the social fronts, all is not well, and exhorting everybody, all stakeholders to, to wake up and actually act, and particular governments, of course, but no one really <clears throat> can be uh, of the view that governments, we can lay these challenges at the door of governments alone. It really truly is something which affects us all and we all have to take responsibility. So the question really is whether after the tragedy of the pandemic, or perhaps during it in many cases, we can seize, uh, Colette, if you could just go back to the previous slide, um, whether we can seize the moment to tackle challenges that have evaded us in the past, can we use this pivot point to actually uh, work in a fundamentally different way? <clears throat> to do that, we would need a proper appreciation of a number of things. Why economies concentrate wealth rather than distribute it more fairly? why we draw down on nature rather than renew it, why we push problems like climate change into the future rather than embrace them today. Now, a key factor in all of this, and uh, Colette, you can, you can advance the slide now. A key factor in all this is finance, or rather how we discriminate between finance that supports what we might describe as business as usual, a business as usual economy, versus finance which alternatively um, supports the things that matter at a much more fundamental level. I'm talking about public health, social inclusion, healthy soil, forests, clean water, clean air, st stable climate, each of which has immense economic value, often uh, almost indeterminate in terms of how it supports economic activity, yet it rarely appears in prices. So how do we actually move finance from uh, where we are now, notwithstanding the good progress which is being made, to something which much more fundamentally invests in what you might describe as our insurance policies for the future? Next slide, please, Colette. One of our, um, I mean, one of the, uh, the really key questions which we're trying to address is um, in particular how the asset management and investment industries where such huge strides are being made at the moment to incorporate ESG considerations. But within the context of lots of alternative, very diverse, sometimes confusing approaches to how we understand whether we're being successful. That's really the basis of our sustainable investment framework, an attempt to try and bring some solidity, some robustness, and some simplicity to the way in which we examine whether a fund, for example, is delivering on its promises or in fact any investment fund is, um, is creating an impact, how it's creating that impact, what that impact actually is. So as we look across the spectrum of different approaches, we have to um, accept that if we're going to create a greener, sustainable or socially progressive society, we need to track how that finance is being deployed and what effects it is having. But how does one do that when the assets in a typical fund are many? The issues behind sustainability are quite complex and the data available to make judgments about that impact are quite limited. Well, we think this problem is particularly relevant to uh, what you might describe as the, the end investor, the investing public, you and me, from which much of the investment capital uh, deployed by the industry actually derives. And we don't really believe that the public needs or wants, importantly wants to know all of the complexity of how those impact measurements are obtained. From our research, we understand that they are really trying to address a very simple question, which is the one on the screen at the moment. Is my money doing harm or good? An easy question to ask, a very hard question to answer. But if we don't know the answer to that question about a fund where a member of the public is putting their savings or their pension, or an insurance company is deploying capital generated from premium, can we really say that the investment process is responsible? We're not sure we can. So if it's possible to understand in perhaps slightly narrower terms whether an appliance like a fridge is uh, 
is how it's performing environmentally or the nutritional content of a breakfast cereal. Why not for a fund? That was one of the conundrums we faced. Next slide, slide please, Colette. Of course, when you ask a question like, is my money doing harm or good? You have to have some anchor on the word good. We don't want to reinvent what good means. So in our case, we simply adopted the sustainable development goals from the UN. Why? They're the closest thing. I sometimes say that the world has to a strategy. They were agreed by 193 governments. They're not perfect, but they went through a process of five years of consultation. And I think as a, a unifying construct of what good uh, would be for the planet, they don't do a bad job. So um, it, what, having sort of established whether or not we are um, what, what, what direction of travel we need to go in through our investment, we can then look at how the funds are stacking up against that. Next slide, please, Colette. So to keep things simple, we took the 17 SDGs and we uh, distilled them down into six impact themes. You can see those in the middle basic needs, well-being, climate stability, resource security, healthy ecosystems, and decent work. You'll notice three of those are social in nature and three of them are environmental nature. And um, the example I'm giving you on the screen at the moment is for climate stability, something we're gonna talk about in more detail later. But if you look at the process of distillation, on the, on the left-hand side, we see four highly relevant SDGs, including the one directly on climate change distilled down into the climate stability theme in the middle, and then quantified through some very basic measures into both a measure of absolute performance in terms of emissions performance, and we'll talk later about how that might be advanced into temperature scoring, and also relative performance in terms of how it compares with other funds or against, in fact, a benchmark, a benchmark of choice for the fund in question. Those measures can be calculated for any fund, we intended this originally for public markets and piloted it uh, initially with uh, equities, but we're just looking at applying it to fixed income and there's no reason in principle why it can't be expanded to other asset classes. Next slide, please, Claire. If we expand up from that one example on climate stability to the six themes as a whole, uh, we arrive at this dashboard which is what we describe as the sustainable investment framework. Six measures, six absolute, absolute numbers relating to the performance, the outcomes, and uh, a relative performance judgment, which is illustrated through the color coding. The top set, if you look uh, uh, carefully at what those numbers mean, are all the environmental ones. And in fact, lower numbers means lower footprint, means better for the planet, whereas Underneath the three in green in this example, higher numbers is actually better for the planet because they're socially positive uh, metrics. That's the framework. In summary, because I want to move on uh, quickly towards our focus today on climate change and how one can create uh, new and compelling measures of performance. The summary for the framework is really that the measures are derived from the SDGs. The number of separate measures we've kept reasonably small, uh, certainly less than the 17 SDGs themselves. Um, we hope that the uh, areas we've chosen are meaningful for the public, not just specialists. They focus on outcomes of the investment process, not the inputs or the process behind the investment itself. They're universally applicable. We have initial focus public markets, but we believe they could be extended further. They're transparent uh, in terms of a published methodology. They're usable with today's data, which is quite important. Anyone can use this method on data downloaded from uh, all of the usual providers and get results. And the, the thinking and the science behind the measures is actively in development as new data become available, uh, new understandings about how companies uh, interact with both society and the environment becomes clear. So these, this is really a project in motion we intend to um, keep it up to date and keep it refined as uh, new opportunities exist. Thanks, Colette. Next, next slide, please. I'd very much like to um, 
pursue, uh, change gear a little now, and I'd like to concentrate our minds on uh, one thematic area notable for a certain conference coming up in Glasgow later this year, obviously climate change. And if I may, I'd like to put a couple of questions to you, the audience, first of all. And the first one is, do the funds that you work with or invest in, if you're part of the industry, publicly disclose their climate performance? So think about, think about a fund that you happen to be either invested in or you work as part of a team uh, to run, or simply a fund if you're not in the industry and you're not uh, personally invested, uh, a fund that you may have in mind uh, through a partner or through uh, some other means. Just think about those funds. Now, do they publicly disclose their climate performance is the question. I'll give you a few moments to see if you can put some answers back to us. Second question, do the funds you work with or invest in? Oh, excuse me, that is the first question, yeah. Do we have some results, Jason? Fabulous. Okay, 33% of the respondents uh, regard the funds that they're thinking about as disclosing publicly their climate performance. 42% uh, believe they don't disclose their climate performance and 25% unsure. I think that's really interesting because we're at a situation now where global attention is placed on climate change. It has been of course steadily um, ratcheting up and the fact that we have uh, such a large number of of funds which are not disclosing their performance in that respect is at one level quite understandable because the industry is where it is, but at another level quite alarming given that we don't have long to get this challenge under control. And I suspect, I can't quite tell which funds you were thinking about, but I, I suspect that one of the reasons is that um, the funds that are disclosing may be the funds which have an, an overt commitment to becoming a more sustainable uh, a sustainable activity. Um, they may have a label, they may be called green or sustainable or other socially progressive titles. Whereas I think the point of our discussion here is that all funds have impact and potentially all funds need to be disclosing their climate performance. But certainly in this case, more funds not disclosing than were disclosing is quite interesting. Okay, um, Jason, I think we have another question. Okay, looking at our second question, with the funds that do disclose their climate performance, so that was some um, in the 30%, um, what method is actually used? Is it an in-house or external rating, a carbon emissions or intensity method, the percentage of assets aligned with the Paris Agreement, a temperature score potentially, or some other method? So I'll give you a few moments for that. Jason, whenever you feel we're ready. Okay. Very interesting indeed. Um, my attention, given the purpose of this webinar, is immediately drawn to the temperature score method, which is currently at 3%. So there are funds which are doing that, which is really interesting, but not many. 
and most are reliant upon some, well, uh, either carbon emissions footprint or footprint intensity, that's footprint uh, by revenue or sales or some other, uh, some other financial indicator. So many, 44% are based around footprint and many are based around ESG rating, which of course could be done internally if you're an asset manager with that kind of capability uh, or another part of the industry, or it could be an external rating uh, imported from uh, one of your service providers. 8% are rating, uh, are using a method based on alignment with the Paris Agreement, which is interesting. Temperature scores are partly in that space, but uh, uh, expressed as a temperature rather than a percentage of assets aligned with a particular ambition like the Paris Agreement. Okay, fascinating. Um, well, thank you very much. I think one thing which is clear, if we could sort of move on to the next slide now, is diversity. We have a lot, even in this example, we have a lot of different approaches to uh, disclosing climate performance. That's precisely the finding that we found in our uh, two-part series, which uh, Lucy trailed at the beginning of this session, which looked at understanding the climate performance of investment funds. And I'm just gonna briefly run through the first part of that uh, series. And Pablo Salas is gonna lead us through uh, the second part, which looks at the methods of temperature score design. Now, the first part of this series is uh, quite interesting in that it explores different approaches, uh, the diversity approaches, which has just been revealed in the poll, to how funds um, report, measure and report their climate performance. And we used a set of leading climate funds, funds which have expressly stated their interest in addressing climate change in one respect or another. So one can, um, one assumes uh, that all of those funds were active in the measurement process and indeed that was the case. However, within that set of uh, leading climate funds, there was great variability of methods. And whilst each of them is justified in its own right, um, there's no reason why one shouldn't assess uh, these kinds of relationships through a risk lens or an impact lens or an alignment lens. The variability can inhibit comparison when there is no more universal approach to um, to provide, if you like, a, a regular way to understand all funds rather than the particular specialist approaches which one particular uh, asset manager or another chooses to select. So it, comparison is somewhat inhibited, but also potentially if you're non-specialist, a member of the public, the investing public, you may see a plethora of different approaches and not really be sure, back to that question, is my money doing harm or good? Which ones are actually relevant to your personal interest as an investor. So good work, but highly variable, I think was one of the conclusions we made. In terms of where we, we believe this analysis uh, should go next, we believe that investors need a simple, universal way to understand their climate performance, the climate performance of their funds, in terms of how it aligns with what globally the ambition is, the Paris ambition keeping global temperature rise under two degrees, preferably 1.5. A universal way to understand that across all funds, not just simply climate funds or sustainable funds or green funds, but across the whole fund landscape, we believe would be not only uh, valuable, but uh, increasingly essential. We also concluded that a sensible option for that measure is the temperature score because it's easily understood by the public, it's expressed in degrees centigrade, something people can relate to. It's based about the outcome. It's based on the outcome of the investment process, not the, not the inputs to it. In other words, it's what impact the fund is having on the real world. So finally, um, I'd like to conclude by um, just uh, um, repeating that the second part of this series, which was published um, uh, just um, over the summer, is looking at the question of if we were going to create a universal way for funds to explain their alignment with the Paris ambition, how would we do that? Our opinion was that the temperature score was the right way, 
But even when one takes that decision, there's a lot of intricacies, a lot of design questions, a lot of assumptions, and even some variability in the way that those temperature scores are put together. Um, we've asked Pablo Salas, who is the, the lead uh, author for that part two, to walk us through some of the choices uh, which need to be made and to illustrate how those choices can result in real results within two funds which are managed by the ILG members. So at this point, I'd like to hand over to you, Pablo. Thank you. Many thanks, Jake, for the fantastic uh, introduction to the work that we are doing here. Um, it is a real pleasure to be here as well. My name is Pablo Salas. I'm a senior research associate here at Cambridge. And um, here we are going to get just a little bit more technical to unpack what do we mean with a temperature score. So, Colette, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so, let's start with kind of common ground here. Right? So, uh, a temperature score is a methodology that typically attaches a score to companies or portfolios based, of course, on the potential contribution to climate change. So, for instance, let's imagine you have that is in the screen, a company or a set of companies, and you also have now a metric to measure the impact in, in climate. And then you can compare the performance of these companies with a set of benchmarks. These benchmarks are typically based on the scenarios, uh, but for now, let's assume they are a black box that actually we are going to open during this presentation. Now, based on the comparison between the benchmark and the metric, the company receives a score, which can be in units of degrees Celsius or other type of indicator. You can also, of course, define a navigation in order to evaluate one company or set of companies in an entire portfolio. Now, there are, of course, other indicators not using temperature as the score metric, as very well uh, our previous question and, and the audience indicated. Um, more generally, we talk about portfolio alignment metrics. And by that, we mean metrics that measure how aligned are companies or portfolios with respect to the Paris Agreement targets. Now, temperature scores are a subset of those metrics. We argue that temperature score is particularly useful because it provides a very intuitive and simple way to check if a company is or not aligned with our climate objectives. If you say a company is a two degree C company, Pretty much a lot of people can understand that. But if you say a company or a portfolio has 20 grams of CO2 per dollar, very few people will understand what you mean by that. Uh, so therefore, the temperature score, we believe, is the best metric that we can use for a universal disclosure of climate alignment. Well, let's go to the next slide, please. Over the last few years, uh, the landscape of portfolio alignment metrics, and particularly temperature scores, has flourished. Here you can see in the screen just a sample of many of the existing current metrics available in the market, from MSCI, Arabic, CADP, and so on. Now, of course, having these metrics is a very good thing, because it shows that there is a growing demand for understanding the impact of investment on the environment particularly on climate. But the big question, particularly for you, the audience, is what metrics should you use and why? And unfortunately, there is no clear answer to that question. The lack of comparability across methodologies is particularly troublesome. And I will show you that with one very real example. Let's go to the next slide, please. BNP Paribas Cardiff used two different methodologies to analyze the temperature score of their equity and bond portfolios and obtain very different results. They compare the carbon impact analytics methodology against the science-based two degree C alignment or SB2A methodology. You can see in the screen the results of the 2018 exercise. There are almost, this, let's go back to the previous there. As you can see in the circles, there are almost two degrees Celsius difference in the score of the equity portfolio and one degree Celsius difference in the score of the bond portfolio. So how can it be that the same portfolio performs so differently with metrics that are supposed to be measuring the same? 
Now, if you read the report, you can find the text that you can see in the screen, but put it in on very simple terms. What the report concludes is that one methodology included the targets of the companies in the metric, while the other methodology didn't. So in simple terms, what happened is that the two methodologies were measuring different things. And this example pretty much highlights one of the most relevant challenges of the field nowadays, the lack of compatibility across methodologies. Let's go back to the next slide, please. Based on this challenge, we decided to get rid of the black box that we saw in the original diagram and build a methodology based on three main principles, the one that you see here on the screen. A methodology that is simple, so it's very easy to understand even for non-experts. A methodology that is transparent, so all the assumptions are fully disclosed, so people can really replicate it without using complex modeling platforms or even hiring expensive consultants. And the methodology that is robust, which is based on the last information we know about climate science. Next slide, please. Now, let's start with the last point regarding what we know about climate science. So maybe some of you may recognize this graph. It is from the latest IPCC report published very recently, and it shows the relationship between cumulative emissions in the horizontal axis and global warming in the vertical axis. Now, based on the last roughly 170 years of data, the one that you see in the black line, it is clear that there is a linear or almost linear relationship between cumulative CO2 emissions and global warming. This linear or almost linear relationship is known by the climate science community as the transient climate response to cumulative carbon emissions, or TCRE. Then we go to the next slide. Please. This is a very long name, but actually the concept is very simple. This is a very empirical found relationship that connects cumulative emissions with warming. And it says that actually their mathematical relationship is the simplest one that you can imagine. There is an almost linear relationship between cumulative emissions and warming. Let, let's go to the next slide, please. Based on this understanding, we decided to propose a methodology that measured the climate performance of companies using this TCRE function. And we created this methodology using four very simple steps. The first step of the methodology is to estimate the carbon or the emissions intensity of the company or the portfolio. The second step, let's go to the next one, is we go from the emissions intensity at the portfolio level and to calculate what would be the equivalent global CO2 emissions of the portfolio now at the global level. So here we are answering the question of what would be the global mean temperature increase at the end of the century if the entire economy had the same emissions intensity as the portfolio that I am analyzing. When we move from emissions intensity at the portfolio level into equivalent global emissions, then we go to the next step, which is the step three, which is now projecting those emissions into the future. Because as you saw in the previous graph from the IPCC, in order to estimate warming, you need cumulative emissions. It means you need the sum of emissions over time. Therefore, in order to estimate the temperature score of a portfolio, you have to understand how the emissions of the portfolio are going to be evolving over time. Therefore, you have to project the emissions into the future. That's what we do in step three. And finally, step four is about calculating the temperature score. But when you have already the cumulative emissions, then the step four is trivial because you use the TCRE function that I just showed you in the previous slide. Let's go to the next slide. So the four steps that I just um, showed you, they look very simple, but there are significant assumptions behind each of the steps. And the key for converging towards a standard approach for temperature scoring is precisely to be fully transparent about those assumptions. 
This is why our report has so many annexes, because we fully address each one of the underlying assumptions behind, behind these four steps. Of course, I don't have time to discuss all of them in this presentation, but I will show you now some of the main assumptions behind each of the steps. So the first step aims at estimating the emissions intensity of the portfolio, which measures the emissions per unit of economic output. So emissions intensity measures carbon emissions per unit of economic output. How do we estimate the carbon intensity? Well, first of all, we need to estimate the emissions. And for that, we use a scope one and a scope two emissions as defined by the greenhouse gases protocol, which is by far the dominant system used by companies to disclose their emissions. They represent direct emissions plus the emissions from their energy use. We decided not to include scope three emissions, which are indirect emissions embedded in the supply chain, uh, although there is plenty of uh, evidence about the importance of a scope three. Now, why we decided not to include a scope three is because, unfortunately, the quality of the data at the moment is very low. And that is due on the one side to the reporting, but also on the fact that modeling tools used for measuring emissions in the supply chain are still in a very early stage of development. Therefore, we decided to leave scope three out of this metric, but we do understand that it would be ideal to incorporate it when the quality of the data and the method allows it. In terms of economic output, we use sales revenue. And the reason for this is very simple. When we estimate equivalent global emissions, that is in the next step of the methodology, we use global GDP, which is an indicator of annual economic activity at the global level. Now, we need to use out now at the company level a similar indicator. And that is why we use sales revenue, because both of these indicators, one at the company level, the other at the global level, they measure annual activities from companies. Now, by dividing carbon emissions by economic output, we obtain the emissions intensity of one asset. Therefore, the emissions intensity indicator that we call SERI for carbon emissions to revenue intensity is simply the division of scope one plus scope two emissions divided by revenue. Now, at the portfolio level, the estimation is a bit more complex. In 2020, the Partnership for Carbon Accounting Financials, or PCAF, which is a global partnership of financial institutions that work together to develop and implement a harmonized approach to disclose emissions, and they publish a guidance of how emissions should be attributed to an asset or a portfolio. In the case of equity portfolios, PCAF suggested um, that the use of investment over enterprise value, including cash or EBIC, will be the right way to attribute emissions to a specific asset or to a specific portfolio. Therefore, we just follow this approach and we allocate emissions based on this uh, investment over EBIC. So that's, let's go to the um, one click, please. So at the portfolio level, we created a SERI indicator, um, carbon emissions to revenue intensity now but at the portfolio level, which looks complicated, but actually it's not at all. In the numerator, we have the total emissions of the portfolio, scope one and two emissions, but they are allocated to the different assets of the portfolio following the PCAF standard. In the denominator, we also have the revenue from uh, the portfolio, and again, allocated to the asset following the PCAF standard. Notice that when we have a, a portfolio of one single element, the SERI at the portfolio level and the SERI at the asset level, they converge because it's the same indicator, which makes a lot of sense. Let's go to the next slide. Please. Now, the choice of the SERI indicator uh, to measure emissions intensity at the portfolio level follow a very thoughtful process, which included variable feedback from experts in the field and the incorporation of the recommendations from the latest TCFB consultation process. Firstly, 
we use um, revenue in contrast to other metrics such as uh, market capitalization in the denominator uh, of the indicator uh, because we want to make it compatible with the indicator at the global level. So in the case of the global level, if you want, if you want to measure emissions intensity at the global level, typically you use global GDP in the denominator. So that, that is why in the survey we use revenue in the denominator. Secondly, the attribution factor that we use, which is the one which is based uh, on the PCAF standard, uh, pretty much follow uh, what most of the financial institutions are using for attribution of emissions. So therefore, it's fully compatible with the standard that is being implemented at the moment, at the moment following the um, PCAF approach. And finally, the aggregation from asset to portfolio level is not simply by weighting the emissions intensity of the asset using the portfolio weight, but actually by aggregating the emissions and aggregating the revenues using these attribution factors. This was indeed, that this approach was the recommendation number 20 in the last PCFT portfolio alignment metrics. Uh, and, and that's why which they call it aggregated budget approach in contrast to portfolio weight approach. And that is why we use it here in our indicator. Let's move to the next slide. So in the first step, we created this um, survey metric in order to estimate the carbon intensity at the company or portfolio level. The next step is to calculate the global carbon emission equivalent of the portfolio. So therefore, here we need to answer the question, what would be the global emissions if the economy had the same carbon intensity as the portfolio we are analyzing. In an ideal world in which the company level data is fully compatible with the global level data, we can just multiply the emissions intensity of the portfolio by the global economic activity, measured for instance by GDP. And then you obtain global emissions from intensity. Unfortunately, we don't live in an ideal world so company level indicators typically are an imperfect proxy of global level data. For instance, if you assume, if you use um, a scope one and a scope two emissions, and if you sum them, all of them over all the companies, you don't get global emissions. Similarly, if you sum all the sales revenue from all the companies, you don't get global GDP. So the same indicator I showed you before, although it's a good indicator, it's not perfect. And that is what it needs a compensating factor, which is what we call theta. Now, how do we calculate this theta? Well, we estimate SERI for what we call a representative portfolio, a portfolio that is representative of the global economy. We discussed with many people of what kind of portfolio that would be, and we finally decided to use the MSCI All Country World Index as a portfolio that represents the global economy. Then we compare the emissions intensity of that portfolio with the emissions intensity of the global economy. And that gives you the value of the scaling factor that you need in order to move from data at the company level into data at the global level. Naturally, there are some limitations in this uh, theta element. The main one is that the MSCI or country world index is not open access. The second one is that not all the companies in this index disclose their emissions. But actually, there is a representation of what is currently happening in the financial sector. Uh, as more companies disclose their emissions, the value of theta will become more accurate. So we recommend in the report to calculate this theta yearly. And ideally, we can, for example, move uh, in the future towards creating an open access index which would be representative of the global economy, for instance. Um, so, in step one, we move from company level emissions intensity to step two, which is global emissions. But now we need to decide how those emissions are going to evolve over time. And that is done in step three, estimation uh, of the cumulative portfolio. Now, as, as mentioned earlier, we really need now to look how emissions evolve over time. So, therefore, we Let's, let's go to the next clip, please. So it's very important that we look for not only emissions at one time step, but actually we look at emissions over time. 
Now, you can design uh, different ways of putting emissions over time. You can say, well, emissions actually are going to boil based on the targets of the companies, or they are going to follow a constant projection, or maybe they follow the pattern that they follow in the past. Now, we believe that for reporting purposes, it's much better to use a constant projection that reflects the current status of emissions intensity of a company. However, for a strategic analysis, we recommend to use forward-looking projection. So actually here, the methodology is totally flexible and you can use it both ways. You can use it for reporting and for that we advise to use constant projection, or you can use it for a strategic analysis and for that you can incorporate targets. Next, next slide. Now, now that we have emissions trajectory, actually we have solved the problem because as we saw before, next click please, uh, when you have an emissions trajectory, you have cumulative emissions, and therefore you can estimate warming straight away using the TCRE function I showed you at the beginning. So step four is a step forward. Let's go to the next slide, please. Here, we're looking at actual um, results from two real portfolios from the investment leader group. Uh, for anonymity, we call them uh, portfolio A and portfolio B. So in the right-hand side axis, we're looking at emissions intensity, which is represented by this black dotted line. And in the left-hand side axis, you have the temperature score of each asset, which is uh, the, the color bars in each portfolio. As you can see, most of the assets are very green. They have a very low emissions intensity, but very few assets in this portfolio have very high level of emissions intensity. And of course, the temperature score is proportional to emissions intensity by construction. Now, because you have so many assets in the portfolio that are super green, the average, let's say, the salary of the portfolio is very low. It's 1.68 in case A and 1.67 in case B. Next slide, please. Now, here we're looking at the same at portfolio A, exactly the same graph as before, but we separated the asset by sectors, by three sectors. Um, and you can see that actually, um, Let's go to the next click, please. If we move from a, what we call a universal temperature score or a sector agnostic temperature score into a sector specific temperature score, then actually the score that asset can get in different sectors may vary. And the reason for that is very simple. When you move from a universal score to a sector specific score, uh, the carbon budget of each sector changes. And then you see what happened here, which in practice, uh, having the same emissions intensity, uh, some, some sectors which have lower carbon budget may get a higher temperature score. Now, in our report, we really focus on the universal metric, but we, in one of the annexes, NXD, we show how can we create actually a sector specific metric that uh, many financial institutions are interested in. Next slide. Uh, next click, please. Here are we seeing exactly the same phenomenon with portfolio B. So in the case of portfolio B, again, you have one score of, of, for the portfolio using a, a sector agnostic metric or a universal metric. But when you move to a sector specific metric, then you have a specific sector with a smaller carbon budget. So sectors that need to be decarbonized faster. And in that case, those sectors, of course, assign a higher temperature score to those assets. So therefore, it's very important to understand that uh, a universal temperature score may give you different results than a sector-specific score. Let's move to the next slide. So you may ask yourself, well, why uh, did not we focus on a sector-specific uh, temperature score with a sophisticated forward-looking analysis? Well, actually, we would love to do that, but we strongly believe that first, we need to agree on the common ground on how portfolio alignment metrics work, and especially how temperatures score work. So the core of our um, report was really trying to build the common ground of what are the metrics that we want to build and be fully transparent regarding the assumption that we're making. So we believe that uh, by supporting global reporting standards based on transparency, simplicity, and robustness, 
we really can accelerate the integration of climate metrics into the financial sector. And finally, the last slide. Uh, of course, there are some challenges ahead still. So the lack of standardization is by far one of the main challenges in this field. And we hope our report help to open the discussion and try to converge, particularly in the assumptions that we make at each step. And that is why having simplicity and transparency as part of the metrics is so essential. But of course, there are also some technical challenges that are, uh, I don't have time to address here in detail, uh, which is mostly about how can we use a scope three data, for instance, by improving data access and models, also how to analyze other gases, and how to create sector specific and region specific benchmarks, uh, but based, of course, on more transparent and better uh, modeling tools. So I hope this gave you some clarity of what is the situation of temperature scoring at the moment in the field, what are the main questions that we need to answer. And actually, we love for you to get in contact with us uh, in order to maintain this conversation going, because as Jake mentioned, this is pretty much work in progress. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Pablo. Um, and I think we have time for a few questions now. We've had questions coming in um, from the audience. Pablo, I'd like to direct the first one to you, which is uh, what do you consider to be the main advantages and limitations of this metric? Um, and what advancements can we expect to see in the near term? The main uh, advantages of these metrics are the three principles behind it which is simplicity, transparency, and robustness. But especially, I would say, transparency. Uh, I think that is the main challenge of the field right now, and to have it, the assumptions fully available for everybody to see is the key for having a conversation. The main challenge is to uh, build a scope three into it, because scope three is, is important, but unfortunately, the data is not available right now. But also, um, to, to build sector-specific metrics, because some sectors have priority for the carbonization, uh, particularly, for example, the power sector and transport sector. So therefore, we should accelerate finance to, to sectors that need more finance to accelerate their position. So therefore, moving to a sector a specific metric, I think, is an important next step. Jake, did you want to come in there as well? Yeah, I mean, from a, I think, I think Pablo has got it from a, from a methodological. Uh, perspective and also pointing to that innovation in terms of um, sector uh, specific um, uh, versions and also regional specific versions but I, I think for me the, the the main advantage of let's let's not talk about the specific method necessarily which we've heard about but of temperature scoring generally is its way that it connects with the public a lot of what I was saying earlier is about how we bring the public into the investment uh, into the investment decision making process um, they have you know they have values they have things they want to associate with their investment decisions and we've done work previously uh, also with the ILG which reveals just how much interest uh, financial consumers have in getting this right in fact they're prepared to um, you know that they're, they're prepared to make some very uh, interesting choices with regard to the uh, sustainability performance of what they are investing in which are surprisingly robust and i think for the for the industry to provide those choices or in fact to raise the bar on all funds which are being offered to the public i think is really really important but to do that in a very meaningful way in a way that connects with their interests and un is understandable and not confusing so having a temperature in degrees centigrade associated with a particular fund, I think is really easy to understand. People hear a lot about two degrees or 1.5 or five degrees global warming and beginning to understand, particularly perhaps young people who are actually being educated about this at school and in other uh, fora. This is something we need to start talking about. And it's a really important feature, I think, for all funds, not just ones which are claiming that they have a particular climate angle on them. Okay, we've um, we've had a number of questions come in um, in relation to the sectoral approach that you covered at the end of um, the presentation, Pablo. So one here, um, which I think covers a lot of them, is how how have we considered uh, 
um, climate solutions that are emissions intensive, but abate far more emissions downstream. So for example, copper and lithium mines, um, battery, battery manufacturing um, into this temperature score metric, given that obviously these solutions are paramount, paramount, paramount to meeting long-term targets um, and need to be financed, but perhaps in isolation in, in such temperature score, um, you know, don't perform so well. Yeah. So. In general, a temperature score is a metric that goes from emissions intensity into temperature. So it's a, it's a translation metric. Yeah? Uh, when you do it universally, you have the luxury to use, for example, the PCRE function that I just mentioned. But when you do it sectorally, uh, you need now uh, a very detailed perception of what will happen with the sector in the future. And that is why we use typically models, uh, let's say integrated assessment models, which gives you a scenarios of the different sectors in the future. That is a necessary step to move towards a sector-specific method. Now, those scenarios have embedded all those considerations that you mentioned. Those scenarios have embedded what are the trajectory of the different sectors in the future in terms of the speed of the carbonization. And in that case, what the temperature score does is very much uh, reflect the match between the company following that trajectory expected for the sector versus the actual trajectory that the company is following. So uh, I would say all the assumptions regarding the role of sectors and the, their importance in the decarbonization chain would be embedded into the scenarios of the sectoral metric. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Um, another question. So I know that we discussed around how scope three emissions are. Um, are not but could be included in this method. We've had a question around whether um, the methodology also captures all GHG emissions or just CO2. Uh, yes, that, that has to do with, um, with the simplicity aspect of, of the methodology. Um, companies, when they disclose their emissions, they follow the greenhouse gas protocol. Uh, that is the kind of by far the most well-known method. And typically, according to that protocol, they should disclose together with the carbon emissions, the other emissions. So therefore, if, they, if we measure scope one and scope two emissions from a company, those emissions should include uh, non, or non other gas, sorry, non CO2 gases. Uh, now, the TCRE function uses CO2 only. Indeed, that is one of the reasons for using this theta value because we are comparing actually two metrics that are different. So therefore you need that scaling factor to make that correction. Hopefully in the future, climate scientists and that will be published in the PCC, I suspect, um, they will come with similar PCR function for other gases. And when that happens, we will be able to separate well, what happened with CO2 versus what happened with other gases. Unfortunately, today we only have the PCR function for CO2. And that's why we need to do this transformation between scope one and scope two at the company level versus global CO2 at the global level. And I, th I think, Lizzie, to add to that, the, the scope three dilemma is, is ever present, isn't it? Uh, we, would, we would love to be incorporating that, but didn't feel that the data were uh, strong enough, not, not across the, the investment universe that we believe this uh, approach should be applied to. But of course, it's improving all the time. Um, we need, you know, as Pablo said earlier, we need better, higher quality, more conscientiously created scope three data built into larger databases that are accessible and standardized rather than <clears throat> a slightly hit and miss approach that we have at the moment. One that is available, that'll be the first thing that's incorporated in such methods. Fantastic. And time for one last question, which is actually around TCFD scenario analysis. Um, so. In relation to step three of the methodology, uh, when projecting emissions into the future, is this, compar is this comparable to the TCFD scenario analysis? And if so, how could it be leveraged for TCFD um, scenario testing? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. And indeed, um, the, we, we had a fantastic conversation with the team behind the TCFD, the last TCFD report. Uh, we really appreciate that interaction because it was very enriching. Um, and indeed, the, the idea of the step three is precisely for the company or the person which is implementing the methodology in what to choose, right? If you 
use a forward-looking methodology to estimate emissions, for example, if you use companies' targets, then you are following pretty much the recommendations from the PCFG. If you use, let's say, a constant projection of emissions, that would be what we consider would be the best way for going into reporting. But yes, the, the, the step three of the methodology is fully compatible with what the PCFD recommendations are. Thank you. And um, that's it. We're at the hour now. So thank you so much, um, Jake and Pablo, for your, for your presentations. Um, thank you for, to the members of the Investment Leaders Group and all that those who reviewed the method and report itself. And thank you, of course, to the audience for joining us today. Um, as Jake and Pablo mentioned, we really welcome your feedback and engagement on this work. So if you'd like to know more about the methodology or if your organisation is interested in, in using it for your own emissions reporting, please do get in touch. Our contact details are on the slide on the screen now and we'd be very happy to have um, a further conversation. Thank you so much. <laughs>